Welcome, everybody. Here we are again for our Systematic Avoid Initiative program for Hey Teve. So, Malatov and a good Yomtev, Dida Natsach, all good things. Um, we have the great Schos to have here, Rabbi Aaron Loshak. He is an author, an editor, and a rabbi who lives in Brooklyn, New York, with his family. He edits for JLI's popular Torah studies program. And if I understand correctly, you're also in Shluchas, yeah. right here. What a great schuss. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have him. Thank you so much. Okay, good evening. Um, and good yantif to you as well. So as I said, obviously we're here for Hey Tavis. And uh, do you mind if I take a glass of water? Are you okay? Sure. Out of time, I'm going to try to... The less and less formal, the better. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's obviously a lot to talk about the Hey Tavis. So, just a few things, just preliminaries. First of all, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that like the storyline, the history, the background, most of what went on, you are familiar with, correct? Now I'll tell you why I'm assuming that. I'm assuming that a because I would assume that you do know it, and number two is because. As far as like the history buff and all the ins and outs and the backgrounds, anyway, not so much, you know, I'm not necessarily the right person for that type of stuff anyways. So I think um, we'll leave the story for the people who know the story very well. I'm sure you've uh, had the opportunity to do that over the past 24 hours or in general. So, I mean, just to go over it briefly, obviously, we all know what the story was. And uh, so what I want to do instead, instead of going to the actual story, because again, I think we all know it anyways, is um, just want to kind of pick out some maybe some themes, some ideas to talk about from the story, uh, and to focus on some of the things that the Rebbe himself taught us and spoke about in that period, particularly when it was uh, you know after the victory in, on, in federal court on Hey Tavis itself. So that's uh, that's what I do want to do. Fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of things obviously to focus on. And uh, I was looking through some of the stuff, some of the uh, some of the things that are said, some of the things that are stated, and I think there's one one major nakuda which I think is an important idea to think about and to focus on, and hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate it and pull it out as we go along. Um, uh, but before I do that, I guess maybe it will be worth figuring out uh, what, where what's my baseline here. So maybe you could give me an idea where of what you know already as far as the themes of the day, because every day every day Hey Tavis is a theme. Uh, every um, every Chassidish Yantiv has a theme, so you tell me first. What are your What do you know about Hey Tavis? Like, what's the theme of the day? If you had to say it in a couple sentences. The Rebbe and his belongings belong to the people. The Rebbe and his belongings belong to the people. Okay, great. That was one sentence. That's great. Very concise. <laughs> Anything so to add? The level there with the Tainim, the courts were able to see that. The courts were able to see that. First of all, the Rebbe shouldn't go to court. And secondly, um, that that the the star belongs to the Hasidim. Okay, which is a likely said in level there. Okay, that's great. That's true. Anyone else? Anything else to add? I think it's also the kitrig against like Hasidus in our age. I feel like every Rebbe had a, a time period where my life wasn't meant to. You know, it's like uh, maybe you're spreading too much. You're going too far. And I think the Rebbe also saw this as a as a spiritual, the roughness, the Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So all of the above, of course, that's def definitely all part of the themes. And I think we're going to touch upon all the, all the above, hopefully in this, uh, in this hour, I was thinking about it. Like if I bring in the past, but like, you know, Chaim, the you know, this an hour is straight. It's very daunting, I must say, but hopefully we'll be able to survive. <laughs> He'll grade me on the he'll grade I me at the end. Should have brought Chaim. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm saying because usually you're used to like you know breaks, intermissions, you know. When uh, when when you get exhausted, over you just say okay, Chaim, and then let the people sing it. But a bit, that's the, the greater the challenge, hopefully the better the result. So, yeah, like like you also just just basic just to, just to back up just to begin so just the very notion that they even has a theme that's already i think interesting to think about because that's something that we're kind of trained to think about as chassidim we're trained to think about uh every day every year the pagra is has has a theme which if if we want to back up for a second it doesn't necessarily have to be that way 
Think about on any, and any, forget about Yemitah Parkas for a second. Think about any young death, right? So you have, let's say, Pesach, right? You've heard of Pesach? <laughs> so Pesach is an event. It's an event that happened in Jewish history. We were slaves and we went free, right? So it commemorates a certain event that happened in our history. And so it was the exodus from Egypt. But if you ask anybody, anyone, right? What is Pesach about? What is Pesach about in one word? Giving freedom. Freedom, leaving Egypt. Exactly. It's about freedom. So, so every yontif, and not even only the chesedish but every. Oh, sorry, we're just clipping it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the pal mic. That's why it's called that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so every yontif has has a um, has a theme, has an idea that goes behind, it. and that's that's true for every yontif, not only the chesedish yontif. And so we're kind of conditioned to think that way. And that's, that itself is already an important thing to, to, to recognize that when things happen, when, a, when a, uh, an event happens in life or anything happens, it's time to take pause and to reflect on anything and to kind of look into it and to see what is that theme. And what's the theme of that day? What's the theme of that event that happens? Why did it happen? What does it represent? What's the cosmic impact? What's the cosmic implication of whatever happened? So I'm gonna get back to that a little bit, but um, yeah, I think we'll, I'll hope to revisit that point at a, at a point. But uh, just uh, first and foremost, when it comes to hey Tavis, so I actually, I was thinking about something else, but then I decided it was last night. I decided that I was going to uh, take a look at the, the actual Sikh the Rebbe himself said on hey Tavis when it happened on that Tuesday. And I, I was trying to put my kid to bed and it wasn't working out. So I had a lot of time to actually read through it. So, cause I just was able to pull it up really easy on my phone to so the app it was great. So I was able to learn to the whole foot bring the whole, the whole Sikha as I was unsuccessfully trying to put my baby to bed. And it's a beautiful Sikha and it's, it's, it's full of, full of incredible ideas. And so I want to just, before I get to the, what I've talked about before, I think just one, one to that, that the Rebbe shares in that, that, in that, um, in that Fabring, it was very, very, uh, it's a very beautiful idea. It starts like this. So first of all, the original Hey Tavis was on a Tuesday, right? I'm, I don't know how many that's in, I wouldn't think that that's an important detail. But if you open up the Sikha, of that, if you open up that Sikha, and the Rebbe speaks, so the very beginning, the very first thing the Rebbe notes is that it's a Tuesday. What's Tuesday famous for? It's Yom Gimel Shochu Pekitayv, right? It's Yitayv Shemayim, a Tavla Brius. Which I was thinking about it. Now, again, I'm not a massive Bucky in any way, shape, or form. There's many people who know a lot more than me. But in my limited knowledge of what I've learned in my life, I don't know of anybody else who ever made mention of that madrash or like ever made it a big deal. Meaning the fact that Tuesday is Yom Gimel Shochu I don't think, I don't think any God of Yisrael ever like cared that that's the reality. Maybe like and if you look at some random shows, the tshuva is when some rav is writing a tshuva and he dates the the, the tshuva. Maybe if it's Yom Gimel, he writes Shochu I'm not even. I'm not. I'm, I don't read Shalos Hashuvos every day, but I've never seen that. But uh, for the Rebbe, it was a very significant detail. It was very important. It was important that if it was on Tuesday, we should mention that it's Yom Gimel Shochu Bekitayv. And that's the actually Rebbe goes, like, why, how it's Tavu Shemaim and how it's Tavu Labrius. The Rebbe kind of figures it out. I'm not going to get into that, but that it's just kind of, again, this, uh, this idea of really paying attention to every single detail and, and, and mining it for what it's worth, which is... Uh, uh, you know, a way of living that's really, really an incredible way of living. But uh, so anyway, so Rebbe goes to the Sikha and he notes that it's Tuesday. So what do we do on Tuesday? We read the story of, we read the Chumash for Parshas, uh, from Parshas Tuesday, Parshas Vayigash. So it's not we, we're not, we didn't learn it yet this year, but I'm sure you know, you know the story. So what happens in Shlishi Parshas Vayigash? Anybody know offhand? Yeah. Shlishi Parshas Vayigash. For Shlishi Parshish Vayigash, we have the big reveal. So when Yosef finally reveals himself to his brothers, and then Yosef gives what could be arguably one of the most incredible uh, speeches of human character ever. Yosef gives a remarkable speech to his brothers, right? Because they're feeling bad. Oh my gosh, that brother who sold into slavery, now we have to face him. And, and Yosef says some, some of the most incredible words ever. What does he say? This much you know, right? What does Yosef say? I have to like every once in a while get input just to know that you know everyone's still alive. It's not you, or some, or right? It's not you. What's the words? Um, 
Uh, you didn't send me here. Kim elikim. Hashem sent me here. Lemichi was fachani lefnechem. He sent me here before you as a as a lifesaver. Like you're not that important. Right. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not yeah, exactly exactly about it. So so the Rebbe focuses on the story and draws the, the simple the simple lesson that can be learned. But obviously, in 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 many words, to kind of really bring out to any to the people who used to, the Rebbe was talking to then and for any chassid who chooses to pick up the sicha at any time you could look at it it's a sicha for hey tashim and zayin and ever brings out the hero in a very simple in a very simple language which is which is like this what was yes's approach yes's approach was, was something that's uh he said it in the context that happened in his life but it's really it can happen in every person's life and in every context namely that things happen to us things happen things happen all the time to us and uh, not necessarily do the things that happen to us, not necessarily always positive, or do they necessarily do they look positive. So now when something negative happens to us, there's different ways of how we could choose to react. And what Yosef, re, re, what Yosef Atzalik does when he reacts to the challenge, and he says, it's not, he, he, he completely doesn't, like you said, they're not important. He completely doesn't view his brothers as the perpetrators of the events that happened to him. See, that's the key for Yosef emerging as, you know, if you want to use, you know, modern psychological terms, for Yosef not to emerge as a victim, the way he's able to do that in such a healthy way was to recognize that the people who, who did the events to him, they're not really the perpetrators. Rather, it's Hashem. So once you recognize that Hashem is the one who's doing it to you and the people who are doing it and the actors are doing it to you in your, in your life are really just puppets that Hashem is kind of pulling the strings with. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, so if Hashem, if Hashem is pulling these strings, he's making these events happen to me, what message is it? What message is contained therein for me? And that's exactly, that's how you have to approach it. And that's exactly what Yosef did. Yosef said, okay, my brother sold me into slavery. And if you were Yosef, or if I was Yosef, I would have every reason in the world to blame. There's a lot of people I could blame for the reason why my life now looks like a, like a, like a, like a disaster. Right? I could blame my brothers. I could blame my father. I could blame... I could blame the, the Egyptians. I could blame Asia's Petifar. I could blame them. There's a lot of people that they're, they're, they're to blame. And Yosef could have very easily done that. And we obviously would not have been able to judge him had he chosen to do so. But he doesn't. He says that you are just, he, he just views them as puppets in Hashem's hands. And he, and because of that, he actually urge, emerges a victor. He emerges a much more healthy and he actually ends up on top. He becomes the, basically the king of Egypt, the prince of Egypt. So, so the Rebbe tells us, this is how we have to view the things that happen to us in our life. That, that um, so now there's kind of two layers here of what I, I think, at least what the Rebbe is trying to tell us. So one layer is, the one layer is just a general approach and one is more specific to how Yosef responded. So I'll start with the second one. How Yosef responded was, again, to see it as something that's completely perpetrated from on high and therefore it's up to me just to interpret it in a way of how I can make myself how it can make me better, how I can further myself in my Avedis Hashem, depending on, you know, whatever the challenge is. But there's another layer I think the Rebbe talks about, and that's the thing you can look it up. And that's the, he, he says something to the effect that when something happens to you, and he draws, the Rebbe draws us from the fact that Yosef is giving us this speech after the fact. Right, so Yosef, it's now Yosef is on top. The story is already positive. He's a, you can, he can already look back and see how it is that way. And one of the notable things that, that, that happens in the story is that Yosef takes the time to look back and, and look at it that way. It's, it, he, because sometimes in life, these things happen to us and then they do end up working out for us. But we don't necessarily take the time to turn around to take, to take stock, so to speak, and to uh, recognize the events for what they were. We just we get caught up with whatever we're doing. You know, life kind of moves on really quickly and we don't necessarily take the time to reflect upon the events that happened to me or us and see how they actually, how they actually all led up to the uh, positive space that I am in now. So this is what Yesef does though. Yesef gives this whole speech, again, after the fact, when his brothers are, I'm 22, how many years later? It's, um, it's 22 years. I don't know. It's a lot of years later. It's it's a long time later, 
And Yosef has already, all the trials and all the tribulations that he had to go through, he already went through. And he's already on top. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's the prince of Egypt. He's good. And he looks back. It takes the time to review the events and see them in the, in the light that they, that they probably, properly are. So, so what that tells us, and the Rebbe brings this out, what that tells us is that it's, it's a general approach in life. It's that when something happens to you, you take that Yosef approach. And the way I would say it is to not be lazy, to not be lazy. A lot of times, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this, and I'm sure everybody's guilty of this at some point. There's so many things that happen to us on an average day, so much. And not necessarily, I'm not talking about massively existential challenges, you know, even just stupid stuff that happen all the time. Just whatever, go through your day, you slip in the snow, whatever, the car, car drives by you and sprays you with the dirty snow, and you're like, oh, and these things, you know, all these types of things happen. And I mean, that's from like the trivial and the stupid and it could have, and there could be things that are more, you know, of more impact. But the point is that things are happening all the time that are not necessarily directly a result of what we do. Things happen to us. So now the lazy approach, now I would say it's lazy. I call it lazy because that's not really such a fair way of saying it. It would really be, it's the default approach, really. Yeah, it's to say whatever, whatever, you just kind of move on. You don't either because you don't have the time to think about it, or you, whatever you're too ca caught up, or you know whatever you're reading on your phone was too too interesting. It depends. We all have reasons why. Or I think it's just a default state of being. And every human being is not necessarily you know on an average day concerned to take the time to really think to think into it in, in such an existential way into the, all the little stupid things that happen along, on an average day. So it's you know it's 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 not necessarily an easy thing to do. But what the, what the events of someone like Yosef Atzadik and seeing the way he responded to the events that happened to him in his life, it, 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 it reminds us, it teaches us that we really should do that. We should not let life pass us by. We should look at the events for what they are. So now, when, when it's like a massively negative thing, huge challenge, right? So then it's a little bit, ironically, becomes actually a little bit easier because you stop and you're thinking, well, like, why? Why is this happening to me? But the truth is, it, ha it happens, it should be like that anytime. Anytime something happens, you have to tell, you have to ask yourself, why is this happening to me? What's the message? What, what's, what, what, what's, what's Hashem trying to tell me with the, you know, what, why the car sped by and sprayed dirty snow on my dress? What's Hashem trying to tell me, right? Does the dry cleaners down the block need more saparnasa? Maybe. I don't know, but there's always something. There's always something at play. And it's up to us to kind of be, to, to wake ourselves up out of our own laziness, to kind of think into it and figure out what it is. So that's, that's like kind of the baseline. That's the baseline. And then the Rebbe adds another, I think, another thing. Again, I'm kind of pulling from memory here. I don't know if it actually goes in the sequence exactly, but you'll learn to see it for yourself and you'll tell me whether or not I plagiarized, whether or not I got it right. But um, then the Rebbe says another thing, which I think is like also incredible. So, but, uh, before I get to the next thing, so that's our, that's baseline number one. Point number one: if I if if, you're, if, if I could do just that, then Dayenu, right? Obviously, if that if I could lead a life like that, then it'd be incredible, right? But then the Rebbe does not obviously satisfy. Well, it's not even long. It's not a very long fabrengin. The whole fabrengin is maybe like in the printed sechets, maybe I don't know, like 13, 14 pages. It's not that long, you know, relative to Shabbos fabrengin, which is like 50, 60. You know, this is not. So I can imagine the Rebbe spoke probably for. 45 minutes, maybe? I don't know. I didn't see the tape, but um, the printed is, if it's 13, 14 pages, it's probably around that long, maybe an hour. So it's not that long. So, but obviously, obviously everything, and, you know, obviously the older I get, you know, I realize the smarter everyone else is, is around me. So <laughs> when I was younger, I used to be able to rip through a sikha, rip through a mimer really easily. You know, it was really, it was really easy. But as you get older, as I get older, it gets harder and harder to rip through it because there's so much, every page, it's like, whoa. It's actually funny when I was a 14 year old kid in uh, I grew up on Shlichus in Santa Barbara, California. So when I was four, uh, we didn't I didn't grow up learning Yiddish. I, I learned Yiddish later in Yeshiva, but uh, I'd learned Hebrew earlier on because I learned Chumash and Mishnayas, whatever. So Hebrew I knew before I knew Yiddish. So they, we had some college students who would come to my parents' Chabadas every Shabbos, and um, my father. At that point in life of his life already, he was uh, Shabbos afternoon was his time to. Um, to do other holy things. So, namely to sleep. 
And uh, these kids, these college kids, I was like sitting around because they would, they would walk in, they would try to keep shopping. So they'd sit in my parents' house the whole day, just bored. So, I, you know, I was 14, I was 14 years old and uh, I wanted to learn with them. Their yeah, I was 14 years old, I wanted to learn with them and I didn't speak any, I didn't learn Yiddish. I couldn't learn the average of I couldn't learn. So I learned the Marmarim and Lukatim of the Rebbe from Sefer Marmarim and Lukatim, that's in Hebrew. And I, Every time I think about the fact that I was 14 learning, it makes no sense to me because I don't understand those my mom today. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I was doing. I'm, forget about what I was doing. What were they thinking? I have no idea because I was translating the words that I, I don't think it made any sense because, again, I don't even understand them today. I try to learn in my room and look at hey today. It's like it takes me hours and I, my head is spinning by the time I'm done. So I'm like, how did I do this when I was 14? But anyways, I guess that's the ignorant, the bliss of, you know, the ignorance of youth. So the, uh, so that's step number one. And step number two, again, I, I don't know, there was a state of steps, but you know, if, we could, if I could extrapolate it as such. Step number two of the Rebbe says like this, is that, um, and, and here he relates it back to the events of Hey Tevis. And this, is, this, is, this, this, this kind of blew my mind, because this happens to me all the time. Step number two is like this. So the Rebbe asked a question about the events of Hey Tevis, right? As we know, the, what, one of the major, like, uh, like you mentioned, one of the, so to speak, the opposition, the Kitschrug, the way it was, not so much Baruchnius, but as it was facts on the ground in the, in the court case, was one of the things was that the uh, Friedrich Rebbe kind of was a, personal, was a personal figure. He had his library. And a large part of the argument that the library should pass on to his family members as opposed to the Chassidim was the fact that whatever community, whatever movement the Friedrich Rebbe started in his lifetime was limited to his lifetime. That was then. Now, he, but he, as a private person, he's his own person. And then the movement kind of is no longer active. That was a word that was used. And the Rebbe quoted it, right? It said, and, and in Yiddish, he would say it was nicht aktiv. And it was repeated many times. And, and obviously something that was something the Rebbe very, very much did not appreciate. So, and so the Rebbe spoke about it by this, by this, uh, by this, by bringing with a sikha. And then, the, so the Rebbe reviewed over the, the claim that Chabad is Lavavit or Agucha, whichever, I forget exactly which one, but they're all kind of synonymous that is not active. And so then I'm asked a simple question. What do you like? Obviously on the face of it, like forget about it, you're not a chassid, forget it, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not passionately in love with the Rebbe, fine. Just facts on the ground. It's a ridiculous, it's an absurd claim. I mean, we're talking 37 years since Tafshin knew it at that point. 37 years of the Rebbe's Nasiyas. You go ask anyone, sure today, but even in 1987, go ask anybody what's Chabad. It's not, it was a household name already. I mean, to say that the Lubavitch of Chabad is not active is, it's just, it's just a disingenuous. It doesn't even make any sense. So where did it even come from? So that, that was the Rebbe's question he posed at this for brain. So what do you think the Rebbe answered? You're right on the money. Exactly. What did the Rebbe say? He said that, you know what? It's not really relevant whether or not it makes any sense because it doesn't. But what is relevant is that someone's saying it. And if someone's saying it, that means that in some way there's an asinus mocking. There's some someone, there's some sort of possibility that someone at least could say it. So what does that mean to us? What's the message to us? That we have to do everything in our power to increase so much so that, it, that even this absurd claim would, ne would never even come up. And so obviously, and, and obviously, and there some you learn from your enemies. So what do we have to increase in? And the very thing that they say that we're not active, active in. And being active. So we're going to be more active. So that way, the next time comes around, whenever, not that, not that there was a next time, but I'm saying the next, the next fool who comes around won't even have any material whatsoever to even come up with such an absurd claim because there's nothing to talk about. That was the way the Rebbe approached it. So I, I was just thinking about it. I was like, wow, this is, just, this is just an amazing way to go about life. And I was thinking about it. I mean, I'll give you a very stupid example because... It's a trivial thing, but it's from my own life, so at least it makes sense to me. But it's a stupid example because it's stupid. But anyways, so for example, I uh, I write things. I write things all the time. So part of what when you write and you get and you and, and your writings get published is you have to submit your writings to someone to edit. Now, whenever you submit your writing for someone else to edit to publish on their platform, you always run the risk of being changed, changed or rejected. being rejected. Exactly. You, you run that risk. Fine, you know, if you want to, you know, bloviate on your own Facebook page, go right ahead. No one's going to stop you. But if you want to, you know, be published somewhere, at least some, you know, halfway respectable, you know, standards, so someone's going to have say in whether or not it's, you know, acceptable or not. Fine. So, 
I was just last week, I worked on something. I, worked, I put a considerable amount of time into it and I wrote it and I, I thought it was actually pretty good. And I submitted it and uh, I didn't get any response from my editor. And then I reached out to him a couple of days later. I'm like, what's the deal? He said, well, I had this and this question. He asked me the question, it's by email. So I answered, so I, oh, fine. The question on the material, on the content of what I, have written, I don't know, what I had written. So I, ans I answered the question that he had asked. And then I didn't hear back. So I'm like, and these things expire really quickly because you know it's 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 dated material. So, so I ask him what's going on. And he's like, well, I don't like. I feel like I feel like you're forcing it. Okay. So, so just freeze that moment. What do I do? What do I do? So I'm thinking to myself. This is my I'll give you my thought process. So on the one hand, I know that it's a good piece. I know. I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident that it does make sense. So now what could I have two? I have a number of options of what I could do. So I could either continue arguing with him forcing him to see how it makes so much sense and how I am literally the most, you know, the most is the most brilliant thing written since maybe the Tyra, at least. I could try to convince him that, right? And um, I may or may not be successful. But then I thought to myself, and I, this is, uh, and thank God I had the, I don't know if it's courage, humility, or, or super ego, I'm not sure, I haven't figured it out yet. But at least I thought to myself, listen, the very fact that someone's saying that he doesn't like it and feels that he's forcing, it means that it's forced. Right? Because think about it the other way. I just I tell myself, think about it the other way around. Let's say it really wasn't a force and it was really good. If it was really good, so no one would have any reason to say, to have to, no one would have to say anything. He wouldn't be saying anything because it's really good. And I have submitted things in the past that were really good that went, that went through like vanilla. So the, fact, so the fact that there's opposition here, it just tells me that, it's, that it could be better. It tells that it could be better. So I wrote him back. Okay, no problem. I'll give you something else. So I tried again, Baruch Hashem, I went through. So, so this is, a, it's, a, it's a petty example, but it just, it's a microcosm of how you can approach life. I give you this example because, again, it's something I experienced. It's a stupid thing, but it's something I experienced. Something I could relate to. But we have all these types of things. You have many times, there's a, there's a famous English expression, right, about shooting the messenger, right? So what does shooting the messenger mean? Don't shoot the messenger, right? What does that mean? Huh? Punishing the wrong person, okay. Who gave you the message? Say again, can you say again? It's not from them, but Okay. So so what's the problem with shooting the messenger? Blame. What? Blame. Blame. Okay. But what what do you miss out on when you shoot the messenger? That's the message. Oh, yeah. Right. When you shoot the messenger, so sometimes the message is no good also. That could happen. I mean, that happens plenty of. But in those instances when the message is also, what actually happens to be a good message, but the messenger you don't like, so oftentimes the human tendency is to shoot the messenger. So for one of, for one of two reasons. I mean, there could be a whole host of reasons, but just off the top of my head, for, uh, one of two reasons. Either you don't like the person who's giving it the message, or you don't like the message they're giving. So either way, if you want to kill it, you kill the person. I mean, not kipshute, but... You kill, you shoot the messenger. That way, you don't have to deal with what he, with what he or she is saying to you because you don't like what they're saying. So you just, you just do away with them. Delete WhatsApp. Exactly. <laughs> I don't like this. So I'm just going to delete it. Right? But that doesn't make the message go away. That makes the messenger go away. But the message is still true. So some let's say, and this is especially true when it comes to criticism. Right? We all get criticism all the time. I mean, right? It happens to me at least. I get criticism all the time. And, I mean, everybody gets criticism, you know, a lot of time we live in a world where everyone's a little very, you know, relatively diplomatic. So people couch it in, you know, different words. And, but at the end of the day, people are always throwing barbs and, you know, criticism here and, uh, here and there all the time. So, and it could be in, in any area, area of your life, in your regular mundane life, in your way to Hashem, you know, I, <laughs> how many times, how many times have you turned around? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if this happens, but. Yeah, I mean, all types of things, you know, people criticize the way you daven, people criticize the way you, the way you learn, people criticize, um, parenting. Your, yeah, yeah, parenting, I mean, all types of things, I'm saying, it's in every area of life, every area of life, you always have people criticizing you, now, not necessarily is every criticism that you're going to get is necessarily true, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing that, sometimes, like I, there's always going to be someone who wants to just simply rain on your parade, and that's, that's, you know, is what it is. That's that person's problem. And uh, chances are they don't, they do it to you. They do it to everybody else they know. And 
it is what it is. That, that's who they are. That's their problem, not yours. Fine. But beyond those people who are just simply just those obnoxious, you know, I want to rain on your parade type of person, you have people that tell you things. And, uh, and it could be valid. It could be valid points, valid messages. So the healthy person, the person who is in, plugged in to, to, to the plan, and recognizes that the messenger is simply a messenger from Hashem. Someone like David Amalek who says, Shimin ben Geira is not the one cursing me. Hashem is cursing me. He's just, he's just a tool. Right? He's so much so, he wouldn't even let Yoav kill him. Right? And Yosef Atalik takes the same approach. It wasn't my brain. It's not you. I don't blame my failures in life on you. You're just, you're just tools. You just told me something. You just, I mean, they didn't actually tell him anything. But you just, you know, you perpetrated something in my life. But it's not about you. And so, and, and in the context of hey, Mr. Rabbi said, if someone's saying something absurd, it's absurd. It's totally absurd. The, the, the claim makes no sense. It would be so easy to say that he was either a crack, he was crazy. I don't know what he was doing. I have no idea, honestly. But it's very easy to say, it's to dismiss it. Because when someone says something that's patently absurd, it's human tendency to say, just get out of my life. You're, you're ridiculous. I don't even have to deal with you. And you would be totally justified in saying that. That's totally fine. Here, the Rebbe says, it tells out thousands of chassidim. That, no, you know what it means? It means we have to do more. So that there can't be even an iota, not a crack of the door left open for anyone to say that we're not doing enough. So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, if you could do that, that's incredible. That's an incredible way of living. I, 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 this is, I mean, this is something I, I think the Rebbe has taught us so many times that obviously the Rebbe first and foremost teaches us how to be a good Yid, how to be a good Jew. But beyond being a good Jew, the Rebbe as like a loving father, he really teaches us just how to be a simple, healthy human being. Because imagine if you went around your life thinking that way every time. That's how you conducted your life. Every, all the, anybody that says things that just bounces off of you because you recognize it's from the Shlech and the Ebeshter and it's just going to make me better and you respond to every situation like that. You would be an eminently healthy person. Would, I, I think you would be, I mean, you would, we, we would put all the therapists out of business if we, if we really internalize that message and live their lives that way. We don't live our lives that way. We get hung up by stupid things that, people, that stupid people say. And we get hung up by situations. The challenges way wash over us and we don't respond to them correctly. And then it causes emo, internal emotional issues and we have to deal with them. And again, I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody who does that. I'm, I'm, I'm chief and first and foremost, someone who does it as well. But it's just a window into how, how the teachings of Chassidus and the way the Rebbe taught us in particular could literally just give you a healthy baseline of a life as a human being. So that's, um, that to me is, is, is an incredible gift. And I think that's something we should take home. So L'chaim on water for that. I just have to break it up a little bit, you know? <laughs> Um, so that's that's from the Fabring in, uh, in uh, that there it wasn't a Fabring, it was a Sikha, there is a better standard on Hey Tavis itself on Tuesday, Tushin and Zion. But uh, not but and right, so they teach us, right? Don't say the word but, so we're using and my daughter was asking me, How does that work? And I said, Every time you use the word but, almost every time, just put a comma, right? The word and, and it usually works. Doesn't How old is she? She's 11. Thank God. Yeah. And over Shabbos, I was teaching her to avoid using the words like and whatever. It was very difficult for her. Very difficult. So slowly but surely, we're getting there. So, and. So I was thinking more about the. Um, so these are the. That, this is what I was reading. I, I like telling. I like saying like when I had these things that I thought about. So this is when I was putting my baby to sleep when I was reading this for bringing. Then I had the privilege of having some downtime the other day. So I was, this is what I was thinking about then. The downtime was <laughs> I was davening for the Ahmed in 770 Friday night, Shabbos. And they sing the Chadeli and they sing a Chi for a very long time, like 10 minutes. It's actually usually seven minutes. I've done it before. It's usually seven minutes. Punk that week, was two weeks ago, it was 10 minutes straight. I was I'm not sure why I'm on this or getting three extra minutes. But anyways, so, and I usually, so usually when I go to the Ahmed, I usually try to take a safer with me or something on the way. So I'll have what to do while I'm waiting, you know, he wants to, I mean, I'm not there yet to save it 10 minutes straight. So, so, um, so I usually take a safer with me so I can kind of, you know, spend the time. But, 
the winter Shabbos, like, you know how it is. I came running in, I barely made it on time to the Halal Daven, so I didn't have the chance to grab a safer with me on the way, so I had time to think, which I don't usually have. So I was thinking. So this is what I said, I'll share with you now what I was thinking then. So I was thinking about Hey Tavis, Taka, because I had a call from the lovely people here about what's going to happen here tonight. So I was thinking about it. And, and it actually kind of connects to this, this that the Rebbe said on, on Hey Tavis itself. Just this notion, this notion of looking at an event and understanding it in, in a cosmic way. Just that alone, I think it's kind of a crazy way of living life and it's something that, again, the Rebbe did every single time. I mean, every single time. The Rebbe did so much. The Rebbe was, again, I'm going to go back to the words, not about the Rebbe, but the point is not to, not to be lazy in life. And, and in the Rebbe's, let's say in the Rebbe, I, I'm sure you, plenty of you learn the Rebbe's Torah, right? Obviously. So you learn the Kutusichis and the Marim, whatever it is. So one of the things you'll notice about the Rebbe's Torah and again, I, I definitely didn't notice this when I was 14, but thank God I'm still learning it. So one of the things you'll notice about the Rebbe's Torah, well, I'll ask you, what do you, what strikes you about the Rebbe's Torah? Well, the Rebbe's Torah is unique. The way the Rebbe learned Torah, the way the Rebbe taught Torah, the way the Rebbe looked at Torah. Okay, there was very practical, it's true. As we just discussed. What else strikes you about the, 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 the Rebbe's Torah? Assumes you know a lot of other stuff. Okay. Like all the previous surveys. Particularly in the Chassidus, yeah, yeah. For sure. In the Memoriam, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of like, very, very like, goes on the system, like questions, asking that. Okay. Like, the the thing, Systematic, yeah. There's one thing I'm looking for. You haven't hit on it yet. Like, other the, sort of things that are happening with the Jews. Okay, yeah. There was, yeah, very, pays a lot of attention. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Anything else? It's usually Ruchnius is normal. It's true. The Rebbe's baseline is Ruchnius and it works from there. That's true. Repeat things. I mean, it depends on the case. Yeah. I think it's like when things are important, it's like repetitive or less. Okay. There is. There is. If you... Yeah, it's relevant. It's relevant. It says term lash and hair off more than anybody else. Hamaisho Acre, right? That's definitely something that I've said more than Yelp and definitely anybody else. Very into like this world, this world. Right, practical, exactly. But I'm making uh, everything very practical. So, uh, an answer. Yeah, let's see. Um, he brought a lot of sources for his ideas and bringing the Shiach. Okay, that was very well sourced, that's true. And focused on the Shiach, yes. So another thing that strikes me, again, I, I was going to ask because everything strikes something, there's a different element that strikes everybody else, and they're all true. One thing that I've noticed in particular is that the Rebbe pays a lot of attention to every single silly, silly, what would seem silly detail. Everything is important. And, and like, again, no, no laziness. Everything, every little thing is important. Everything is in detail. And not only that, the Rebbe was very big into Achtus of Torah, right? That everything in Torah is connected. So if it's if, it, if the same three three Purushim on one Rashi, they're all bringing out different points of the same thing. If there's if the name of the person who said the thing in Rashi is relevant. If the events happened on Tuesday and not Wednesday, it's relevant because it's on Tuesday and not Wednesday. Every single thing the Rebbe was just stubbornly, you know, insisted that every single detail has relevance. And it's like it blows your mind because it's like uh, how much, how much can you uh, you know give up eventually, you know? We don't, most people don't think that way. Well, and it, it sounds like background noise and he like brings it up. He's like, exactly. And, and, and not only that, what, what makes, what, what impresses, I mean, I, I don't need to be impressed, but never doesn't need me to be impressed, but what blows my mind, at least, is that in a way, this type of learning, you would, I don't know how many, I'm assuming you're all very smart, but I'm not necessarily so smart, but I know some very smart people. And there's a certain tendency among very smart people to, um, to, to, to view such a like a stubbornness as a little bit primitive, if I may, if you may, if you may say it that way, because like you focus on big ideas, you focus on developing a thesis, you focus on seeing you know big pictures. So you know you, you're gonna get technical on which Tana was the one who actually said the mimer in Rashi or how many words Rashi brought in Zdebra Maskel. If this minutia could get like could get 
to get almost tedious. Or open any fabrengen of the Rebbe from any, any year, any year. Open up any fabrengen. I would say, and for sure in the later years, I would say the first three, five, six, ten pages, right? The Rebbe is spending a lot of time going through like what I would call a preamble before he actually jumps into what's going on, right? It's the day, it's the year, it's the month, and we know, and this, and it's all, so much stuff is going on, and it's like some, some cynical people could see it as a little bit tedious. But the Rebbe was very insistent that everything has so much detail and everything has so much meaning. And the funny thing is that because of that stubbornness, so to speak, that commitment to finding meaning in every single detail, the Rebbe was able to find so much depth. So the, when the Rebbe said, no, the name of who said it in Rashi is important, it adds like a whole other three pages in the Sikh, and you come up with these mind-blowing ideas. I was learning a Sikh two weeks ago, and uh, it's a Rashi Sikh, the complex Rashi Sikh. So again, it's a Rashi Sikh about the Masois and the Midbar. A Rashi Sikh. And the Rebbe gets into the whole discussion about the Chirichashis and the, do we have, and, the, and about sin and about how sin is engineered from on high. It's like wild, crazy stuff, which like, I, I don't, it's, it's, there's a couple of times I've ever revisited this idea. In the so there's a, a more well-known Sikha in Chela um, K for Parshas Lech Lecha. And there's another Mimer in Tashin Lam and Aleph, I believe about it as well. So I've ever revisited this idea more than once, but this idea, namely that not only are the, mis- the challenges that Hashem give us from on high, the challenges that we get, are from, even the mistakes that we make, the sins that we do, those are also engineered from on high. And nothing is outside of Hashem's will. I'm trying to wrap your head around that for a second. That's a crazy idea. It's a crazy idea. It kind of, it's, it sounds like somewhat even, maybe even a little bit heretical. So it's, it's a crazy idea. And it's a very, very deep, profound idea. Now, where does the Rebbe, in that sikh at least, where does the Rebbe kind of like, pull this idea from, where does he find it in the Rashi? From a v'chulu. One v'chulu. That's how the Rebbe finds it. Because Rashi said v'chulu, so that's how we know that not only are the, mis- the, mis- not only are the, the, the challenges that Hashem gives you also from above, but even the mistakes that you make are also from Hashem. How do we know that? Because Rashi says v'chulu. So I'm thinking to myself, that's, that's ridiculous. From one v'chulu, that's what you came up with. You came up with something that can shake the foundations of the Chashis from one v'chulu. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. I mean, in a good way. I'm saying. So, so this, is, um, this is the way the Rebbe approached everything in Limerat Torah and in life. In life, this insistence that everything has meaning, everything is, everything is like much more beyond what it seems. So comes Hey Tavis. And it's true, the Alter Rebbe taught us this way, right? The Alter Rebbe did the same thing. The Alter Rebbe went to jail. You know, there's a famous joke about Jewish holidays, right? They always fought, what are Jewish holidays in one line? Right? They try to kill us. We fought. We won. Let's eat, right? So you could look at it very simply. It's a primitive thing, right? So every Chabad Rebbe went to jail, was freed, go home, we're happy. Let's drink, right? So you could you could reduce it to that, right? So the Alter Rebbe was a leader, was a world leader, a Jewish leader. He had profound impact on his community. He went to jail. That was a sad thing. He was freed from jail. That's a happy thing. So let's uncork the bottles and let's 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 party. So it could be just that, and that would that would be fair. The Alter Rebbe came out of jail and said, "No, no, no, that's not what it was about. I was visited in jail by the Magid and the Balshem and they told me, and I asked them what's going on. And they said, this is a kitchen Momaila, and there was before Petterberg, after Petterberg, and then we were saying to the Alter Rebbe, said, this mamish blew the blew the blew the roof off the house. So it was a it was a crazy thing. So the Alter Rebbe, but the Alter Rebbe was one who told us that that's what happened. We wouldn't have known that that's what's happening. We only had the eye, we only had the, vision, the tunnel vision that we have. The events as they appear in front of us, that's what we see. Now, the Rebbe told us, no, 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 it's way beyond that. So, hey, Tavis also, I think, in, I think really the story of Hey Tavis, in a way, is more primed, I think, even for this tunnel vision. We didn't have the Rebbe telling us what it was, about, what it was about. It'd be very easy to see this as a family feud, because that's essentially what it was. Again, facts on the ground. So it's family feud. It's none of our business. I, mean, I, I, there were, I think there were even more people who felt that way. Like, it's none of our business. It's like something that's unfortunately going on between the family. You know, let, let that happen there. And, you know, we'll find out whatever happens afterwards or we won't. Like, it was almost like that, right? Like, in the beginning, the yeah. Quite yeah, two years. So, not two years, for, uh, for about a year. So then the Rebbe came out by a Fabring, and it was uh, the summer of Tashinam Hay. And the Rebbe may and the Rebbe spoke this fiery sikh, and I just had no idea what hit them. I mean, I wasn't there, but I, I could say that I was born, but I wasn't there. 
And they had no idea what hit them. And the Rebbe kept on pushing and telling, telling the, teaching us that something profound is going on. And like you mentioned, it was really a kitchen. It was a kitchen in the Rebbe's Nasius. It was a kitchen in the Rebbe's Nasius. The same with the Alter Rebbe was thrown into jail. Why? Because he was spreading to such an exponential level, which, um, which reminds me, just to compliment what you said, it was a kitchen on the Rebbe's Nasius. There's a Sikhir I I don't know exactly where it's in the, in the Chaf somewhere. I don't know. Chaf. It's Yitis Kisle Sikhas. It's probably in Chaf or Chafei. I don't know. You can look it up. But there's a Sikhir of the Rebbe about Yitis Kisle. The Rebbe asks a very basic question about Yitis Kisle. That we know that the Alter went to jail. Why do you go to jail? Help me out here. Why do you go to jail? Right? There was a kid. No, I'm saying that was the facts on the ground. Cosmically, why did he go to jail? It was a kid triggers on his spreading chassidus. So there's a famous story. I'm sure you all know it. It's a story with Pichas Karitz and Alter Rebbe. That they one time were walking and they found a manuscript of chassidus on the ground. Right? And Pichas Karitz was very upset. And he said he was going to go to the Alter Rebbe to tell him that enough's enough. He can't spread chassidus so far. So what did the Alter Rebbe tell him? You know the story. Yeah, what was the muscle? Yeah, Give me a break here, go for it. He had a son that was sick, and the only thing that could cure him was the, like every doctor came, and the only thing that could cure him was the long town. Right? <laughs> the Kassar Amal, right? And they, and they said it might not have, I don't know if it was like, you tell her correct, but like, it might not even get it to his mouth, but like, he would take a chance because to cure his son is like his only wish. So exactly. And that's why, even if, a million pages of chassidus will fall on the ground. If one page will be learned by you and me, and will and it'll actually change us and make us better Jews, it's worth it, right? So the Rebbe said, "Chazid over this story and asked the question." So if so, and that was that worked. Pinchas Karzer was pacified. Magid was everyone was happy, and you know everybody went you know everybody went home and everyone was happy, right? Everyone everyone lived happily ever after. Well, not really, but. So the Rebbe asked the question. So if that's the case, the Alter Rebbe already took care of the opposition. Why did the Alter Rebbe have to go to jail again? Right? The Alter Rebbe took care of it. So what the Rebbe answered, obviously because the Alter Rebbe took it to a new level. So whatever the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid did was met with their opposition. And the Alter Rebbe was able to mollify that opposition by giving this remarkable mushal. But then the Alter Rebbe went ahead and took things to the next level. And if you learn the Chassidus of the Alter Rebbe, you'll see that for yourself. And uh, so he was met with his opposition. Sorry, you know, whichever you know, whichever forces were, were vanquished in the first battle, the special forces said, <laughs> this, is a, this, this is a new battle. So they came out blade, guns blazing, and again, the Altareb was able to, to emerge triumphant by coming out of jail. So, we could obviously, we all, I mean, it's just it's simply understood that the Rebbe, the Rebbe took his Nasius, the Rebbe took Lubavitch, and Mamish turned it around 180 degrees, right? We're familiar with the fact that the Lubavitch uh, seven years ago looked very, very different than the way it does today. The Rebbe reimagined almost everything. The Rebbe invented, I mean, in invent, we could say the Friedrich Kevin and the Rebbe Shah were sending out shluchim, but nothing even close to what the Rebbe did. The Rebbe pushed us in the shluchis, and the Rebbe pushed us, Amol Chsidis is all about Avede Matzme, working with yourself, right? They used to say the Chsidim, ironically, the Chsidim talk about Bittu all the time, right? But Chsidim are, are ironically, they're obsessed with themselves all day, because the Chas is working on himself or herself all day. So, Ironically, the ones who are officially touting the bittel, they're the ones who are working on this, are thinking, obsessing about themselves all day. But obviously, it's tongue in cheek because we're obsessing over ourselves to make ourselves better and to change ourselves. So Chassidus was about uh, was about doing mitzvahs behider, skashes to the Rebbe, learning learning Chassidus, and uh, uh, and then you know the lavush, I guess, somewhere down the list. But that was what Chassidus was about. And then comes the Rebbe and completely reimagines everything. And the Rebbe says, he's, the Rebbe sends everybody on, the Rebbe changes everything. One of my favorite examples, by the way, just to give a little, like in a little uh, a tangible example, how different just from the Rebbe to the Rebbe it is, is that, um, is the Rebbe's approach to France. No one in here from France? No. No? France? No. I'm not either. <laughs> if you may, if you didn't guess that till now, so we we know the fame Al Rebbe literally passed away running away from Napoleon, right? That's why the Al Rebbe passed away. I mean, the gosh was. Now the Al Rebbe was vehemently opposed to Napoleon, vehemently. 
so much so he sent his chassidim to be spies for Napoleon, for the Tsar. And the Alter Rebbe was on, when he was running away from Napoleon, he didn't even want Napoleon to get, to get his hands on his possessions. So he instructed his son to burn down his house and everything inside of it. The Alter Rebbe was like vehemently opposed to Napoleon. Now, why? What was the Alter Rebbe's reasoning? You tell me. The Alter Rebbe was afraid of, well, we could boil it down to one word. Yeah, yeah, well, assimilation. Yeah, the result of freedom of religion, right? Napoleon represented the spirit of emancipation, right? Which is really, which is really at the core of what France is, still today, right? France, they're, they're, they're the three words on their, um, I don't know, it's their motto, it's their, I don't know exactly what, what its legal status is, right? But it's, you know, liberté, fraternité, égalité, which means liberty, freedom, egalitarianism, right? It's about Quality and freedom, and they're they're hyper they're hyper focused on freedom on freedom of speech, and no religion, right? So in America we have separation between religious and church and state, but in France it's the other way around. They have they have suppression of religion when it comes to state. There isn't they they specifically stay away from religion. So they're very into their like secularism. That's the like the peak of secularism. And that's really the big. I mean it traces its way back to the French Revolution, but it's Napoleon is like the forebearer of that. So, Alter was opposed to that. So, whenever I heard the story as a kid, I mean, this is what they explained to you as, as I'm growing up in Cheder, right? Alter Rebbe was Napoleon, the Tsar, and even though we were some of the Tsars, it was pogroms and you name it, they had it on the Tsar, but at least the Yiddish guy would be more intact. So, whenever I heard that as a kid, it always struck me as odd. Ah, we're Lubavitchers. We don't, we don't think that way. Since when are we afraid? Since when are we afraid of a little bit of Gashmias? When did that ever bother us, right? We carry smartphones in our in our pockets with, with or without filters, depending on who you uh, who you're talking to. When when are we afraid of gosh We move out on the, the most ridiculous places. I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. I know people grow up in crazier places. I remember one time visiting my brother. He's on the campus in Santa Barbara. I was a bachar then. I visited him for Shabbos, and I remember waking up Shabbos morning and looking outside and just su surveying. Suffice it to say that I looked at it, I was with a friend of mine, I looked at a friend of mine, I was like, how is my brother raising kids in this insanity? It's ridiculous. Baruch Hashem, has beautiful kids so far. Kinan Hara. So, when does, so why, like, it just it always struck me as odd. Why is Al Tarebbe so opposed to it? Well, since when are we afraid of being a little bit of emancipation? Well, we'll show them how to do it. So, obviously, obviously things changed. Obviously things changed. And this is the way the Rebbe taught us. So much so, and Shabbos Parshas Vayeshev, Tashin and Beis, what happened, right? The Shliach, the Mullah Zima from France, brought a whole group of French Yidin to the Rebbe for, for Shabbos, and never spoke about it. Never spoke about France. And never said how, how the clip of France has been transformed, and we're and the, uh, all about, you know, getting ready to greet Mashiach, and we're able to transform it, and the Rebbe embraced the French national anthem itself. And we sing it now every day, every Shabbos, and then Shul for the for Amun. So it's Ma'am Mishal 180. Right from the times of the Alter Rebbe, who literally died, running away from Napoleon, instructed his own chassidim to go to the lion's den and spy on the, on the, on Napoleon in, to help the Tsar. Comes the Rebbe two hundred years, however many years later, and says, "We're going to embrace France and we're going to sing the French national anthem in Shachris on Shabbos." That's I, that's about as a one eighty transformation as you can get, right? So the Rebbe Mamish retooled everything. So he was met with his uh, the Rebbe, uh, the, Came the opposition. Tafshimim Zion hate Tavis was the opposition. I mean, what, leading up to that. And so, and, and this is all the this is the, the Rebbe told us that this was what was going on. We didn't make this, I didn't make this up. No one, the Chassidim didn't make this up. The Chassidim had no idea. This is what the Rebbe told us what was going on. There was a Kitrug Mumaila. And the Rebbe said they're faint, they're, they, they want the bankle. That's what the Rebbe said, right? They want the chair. They want the Nasius. So that's the way the Rebbe viewed it. That's the way the Rebbe taught us to look at it. And Baruch Hashem. We all know the end of the story, but if I could just uh, just just to focus on that type of vision, that type of perspective, is something we should always have. Something we should always have when events in life. So I would say in two in two areas of uh, of life. First of all, in your learning, when you learn, is to learn like to learn at least to try learn the way the Rebbe learned. Learn and be 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 stubborn on every detail and mine it and plumb it for what it's worth because it's incredible stuff that can go. So yeah, it repeats itself fairly often. You should know, and I found this, that if you if you don't get lazy and you really actually read the word slowly and try to understand what is it saying here that it doesn't say here, you'll find that it says something here that it doesn't say here. 
And if you actually work on translating the words, when I say translate, I mean like to talk them through and talk, say them in a way that actually makes sense to the next guy or next person, you'll find that there's so much depth that's lying there if we're just not, if we don't let ourselves get away with falling back onto preconceived assumptions. Oh yeah, I know, I, I, I know. No, you don't know it yet. Read it, learn it, plumb it for what it's worth and there's a lot of depth there. And then in life in general, that's some learning, b'chalal. In the frat, actually, the frat and learning. But then I would say in life in general that we have to walk through life and ask and try to look at things with that kind of Rebbe cook, the way to, um, to view events as larger than life, the stupid things that happen to us, stupid things, the bigger things, definitely the big challenges that you get in life. Don't, don't victim, don't become a victim to those challenges, don't become a victim to those hardships. Understand that there's something cosmic, there's something huge at play there's something way beyond what meets your what meets the eye and it's up to you just to say okay so hashem is giving me something hashem is making hashem i don't know what it is because we don't have that type of vision to actually know what it is we have to just be able to sense that there's something but what we could do is is take it as a sign to say i have to be better in this whatever is being challenging me i have to be better so that tomorrow no one should ever be able to say that i'm not good enough in this respect Thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredible. You're welcome. Um, so now that you said you have this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was not. Uh, <laughs> but it's not so precious. Unless you have this. But... I did that. I did not. Know. Okay. So on behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So this is for You're you. Welcome. And being that you have a baby and a wife at home who shared your time and her incredible yes. husband with us. So I'd like to send this as a gift to your wife okay so thank, thank you. you very 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 much we really appreciate it you're very welcome thank you for the opportunity